Hi, my name is Joe Jackson. I'm an interviewer, author, journalist, and broadcaster. And what you're about to hear is one of the 1,400 interviews I did for nearly all major media outlets in Ireland. How do I know there are 1,400 interviews exactly? Because I recently digitized all the damn tapes myself. But do remember that many of the interviews were done for the print media and recorded on cassette tapes. So some are, let's say, sonically challenged. But I happen to believe that sonic considerations should give way to historical significance at times. And I'm glad to say that at least some powers that be in RTE Radio 1 agreed with me on this and broadcast between the years 2015 and 2018 many of my interviews in a series called The Joe Jackson Tapes Revisited. What follows is a program that was made for that series but never broadcast. However, it has been edited for this podcast from a one-hour show down to two podcasts, roughly half that length, because... Roughly a half hour seems to be the preferred length for podcasts. By the way, if you want to read the interviews as published, plus a fragment of memoir I wrote about my meetings with Gabriel Byrne and the backstory to the interviews, check out the ebook Gabriel Byrne, The Joe Jackson Interviews Plus, which is available from Amazon, Apple iBooks, Barnes & Noble, Eason's, and so on. Or check out my website, joejacksoninterviewer.com. Here's the show. Four years later, at a time when Gabriel's latest movie was Into the West, co-starring Ellen, who was now his wife and with whom he had a child, I asked if it really was true, as I'd read, that he said it took the birth of that child, Jack, to finally make him aware of the real worth of womanhood. So the article said... You said, I don't want to have a child of four, have a ten-year-old child of fifty. That's Jesus one thing Christ. you said. And I, did I really? Yeah, yeah, and I thought that's ironic. My God, and I will have. <laughs> there you go. That long. That's great. Um, the theory of childbirth was what it was to me. Oh, it right. was a theory that I had never experienced. But the, the actual, the reality of it, when you are confronted with that situation there, there is no way you can ever prepare for that. It's like we did uh, all the breathing classes and all that bullshit. It's complete, total bullshit because... The one thing nature knows how to do is prepare you for all that stuff. I mean, the reason I think that a woman carries a child for nine months is that by the time the nine months are up, she is so ready to have the child. Right. That it's an incredibly painful um, thing, apart from anything else, traumatic pain and everything else. And then some of them have to deal with postnatal depression. I mean, Jesus Christ. And then there's the menopause, which now Jermaine Greer has just written a huge 500-page yeah. book on. Uh, and even when the, she said a very interesting thing in that book, actually it's a really interesting book to read, but she says a very interesting thing in that book that it's not over, ever, because when you've reared the child and the child moves away, what replaces that sometimes is a sense of loss and a sure, sense of sadness sure. for the children that they were. I and um, yeah, yeah. it's like it's never over. I imagine you'll tune into that. Huh? I know you're a soul anyway. I think you'll <laughs> tune into that one. Won't you? The sense of loss is already creeping yeah, up on you. And yeah, then... <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're absolutely dead right there. That's have you ever sure. have you ever gone as a man through uh, an abortion situation with a woman? Have you ever been with a woman throughout the experience after it because they suffer the same things? Uh, well, I know I know quite a few women who've had uh, who've had abortions. Yeah, um, and uh, depending on the individual, it's been less or more traumatic right. for some than for others, but. Um, but did that give you any sense of awareness? Would you have ever been part of an abortion situation with a woman where you forced her or asked her or she wanted your child to be aborted? Um, no, I never have been in that situation, never. Right. And uh, I like to think that, you know, I would... Uh, I feel so strongly anyway that no, no government has the right to tell anybody what to do with their body, you know. I, I just so so absolutely believe that that I'm absolutely like almost fascist in, in in that that I just say there is no answer to that I don't care, and you have the the, the appalling vista in America now at the moment of Dan Quayle, and uh, Pat Buchanan those guys the the, uh, the ultra ultra right, um, you know refusing to even allow for for the cases of incest or uh, or, or rape you know that it's about refusing to allow abortion in that in, yeah. in that. Yeah. yeah, but you see, I don't think that they have the, the woman's right to decide for herself is, I think, safe. I don't think you can ever 
But it doesn't look like the woman is going to be granted that right here. No, no. And uh, that's pretty tragic, isn't it? Would you get tangled? You, you understandably would get more tangled up with the American political scenario than you would be with changing nuances in the Irish scene here now. Because I mean, you told me at that point four years ago you just didn't have faith in any political parties. Has that changed? Or are you removed from... I don't, still don't have any faith in any of these political parties, no. I really don't. And I think that um, the only way that I can make a positive contribution here to change in things is by doing certain films. And that's why I, just, why I became, why I decided to become a producer, is because I can get some of the ideas that I feel deeply about made into films, like The Guilt of Four, like the, the Into the West movie. Um, these are, that's the only way I feel that I can positively contribute. I think it's an important way to contribute because I think that even doing a film like Into the West, which we talked about earlier, may not change anything, but I think it'll heighten awareness. It's important at least that the story was told. I think it's important that the Gilbert Four movie is made, not just because it's about a dreadful miscarriage of justice that happened like 15 years ago, but it's also about the whole relationship between Ireland and England. It's, right. it's that story, too. Do you feel as a man uncomfortable talking about abortion? I sense the kind of reserve there. What is it that your situation on it is? Uh, no, I'm not uncomfortable right. about it. I, I just, when you asked me, had I ever been directly involved yeah. with, with, with any incidents of it, apart from those friends of mine who I knew, I haven't actually. Right. The reason I stopped is because when you said to me, would, how would you feel in a situation where a woman came to... That's a situation I've never, I've right, never been in, right, and right. I'd like to think that I'd do the right thing. At this point, the conversation became too personal on my behalf to broadcast, but it then led to us discussing something that is truly timely in the Ireland of late 2015, and a subject that still is rarely discussed, even in the media. There is, I said to Gabriel, a maybe sexist perception that many men callously abandon a woman when she decides to have an abortion, but... There are those who go through the experience with her and who remain as close as is humanly possible through it all, which can deepen their own sense of trauma and loss. But don't you think that it comes down to, again, it comes down to how we, how we tell our children about, about this and how we, uh, um, how we deal with this issue when, when, they're, when they're at school and when they're receiving sex education and so forth? It's an issue that's never addressed. It's like a major right. political right. issue now. And I don't believe that abortion should be a political issue. I th um, but that's the only time it's ever addressed. Sure. That should be the kind of thing that's addressed in schools, right. where men are made to feel part of it. Right. And I agree with you that men do, because I know two particular men, um, uh, one in Los Angeles and one in New York, who have both gone through that situation, and they were devastated by it. Right, right, right. Because right. they, they had no... They had no ground no preparation they were thrown into the situation it was never ever mentioned and then they're confronted and they're expected to know what to do with it. but all this is basically to give you respect for human life isn't it and a sense of what's at the core of human life yeah from that from the very first ever whether it's watching a woman having a child yeah or holding her after she's wept or losing one yeah you know for the, the man needs to get that's about as close as a man can get to those yeah i saw an interview with sting where he talked about that you know he he firmly believes in the whole notion of the male having certain oh, right. female things and so forth, you know. And um, it's it's also as men were denied that thing. Where it's something that we're not supposed to be concerned with grieving and loss and being concerned with the you know with the the emotional response to a child and so forth. That's not really supposed to be. That's the way you were though, isn't it? I mean, you it took you time in life to come to terms with all those signs of your nature. Yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah, because I'm very much a product of uh, the fifties in fifties uh, in Ireland. And I think that one, one of the things that I feel that's most important in my life is trying to come to terms with the stuff that is in there and trying to deal with it and trying to change myself. And I think that I have, I think that I have made great efforts to do that. Not that I'm saying that I have the answers to, to, to things. And I don't, but I'm constantly asking myself those kind of questions and trying to change and, 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 and develop. Do you have to curb a tendency towards violence? Is that part of your nature? Um, I've never been in a violent situation, really. Um, but I recognise in myself that there is a possibility for that. That sometimes at the dead of night, when you get those thoughts, you know, you think that maybe in the right circumstances, 
that violence is something that could just erupt that yeah. you would not be able to control. I think everybody has yeah. that fear. Though, Does that they? worry you in a marriage situation and in relation to children seeing those situations? Oh God, yeah, you're extremely conscious of that, yeah. I mean, thank God I have never, um, I have never laid a finger on, on anybody, but you know, I can see how people, sure. I hate to say this, but I, I can know. see how yeah. people could, can hit out like that. Well, you see, people would look at, we'd say someone like Ellen, mm. and say that Ellen is a tough Bronx-born woman who, who she might be just as likely to hit you a while as you might be to hit her. I think that's probably too... Uh, simplistic, reductionist? It's too, sim it's too simplistic. <laughs> they cut that scene there, that actually she does hit the I guy, she kicks, him, she kicks him in the balls, <laughs> that and makes two sense. seconds later. <laughs> but uh, Ellen is, um, is not a tough uh, Jewish broad. Right. Um, in fact, I, I find this, that the, I, I've been involved with women who have been strong and independent and have said their own thing and they, 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 they are secure enough in themselves to be able to say what they feel. As soon as you do that as a woman, it's immediately labelled as, um, you know, tough, Ball ballsy, all yeah. that kind of yeah. shit. They're yeah. the kind of women I really like. I mean, I yeah. like women like that. Yeah. And... Um, who admit you, to the masculine in themselves, like yeah, you were saying about not, men who recognise yeah, the feminine. Yeah, it's like... It's like they're not afraid to speak over themselves and be who they are. That's really what it is. Right. Like I've seen Ellen on movies. So I saw her in a movie with Jack Nicholson. And I was fiercely proud of the way she was able to stand up for herself. She takes no bullshit. Right. Right. And, and, right. And, and, and that comes from having been visited by bullshit and deciding, that's it. I've had enough of this. I'm standing up for myself. Right. Uh, but the opposite of that is that she's... She's the most, she's the softest hearted person I've ever met. Right. She's a complete, uh, you know. Uh, so is it, is it not a power struggle there in that marriage? Because um, you both try to redefine what being a man and being a woman is in 1992 or in the 90s, surely. And maybe this is representative of where a lot of men and women are these days. Yeah, I think that's interesting, you know, because the whole, um, I'm doing a film now at the moment called A Dangerous Woman, which is right. uh, um, about the whole concept of family, what family actually means. And our notion of what a family constitutes has changed in the last 20 years. You know, it used to be father, mother. But, you know, like there are people um, um, advocating at the moment that gays should be allowed to adopt and, sure, and so yeah, forth. Yeah. So that's all changing. And the, I suppose that in our particular lifestyle, where she's an actor and I'm an actor and we move around an awful lot, um, it's very, very difficult sometimes to keep a sense of right. place, a sense of self, um, a sense of uh, the present. Right. Um, right. Right. These, the, these, these are the things that really I think um, are these. If we have any kind of situation that we have to really grapple with, it's that the sense right. of rootlessness and keeping the family together. Right. Like because I know in four years' time I'm not going to be able to take Jack with me on a location. I'm going to have to spend three months, like not being with my family and sure, vice sure, versa. Sure. So it's very difficult to make those things work. But Ellen is an extraordinarily um, adaptable woman. She has incredible inner strength, and I I say this without any hesitation whatsoever. She's an incredible mother. Right. right. I mean, really, an unbelievable. Mother. How are you as a father? I mean, because I know you had a sense of ruthlessness which has been there in your, yeah. in your psyche since forever, it seems. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and obviously the depiction you've just given of a very shifting sense of the family life you have don't really seem conducive to getting rid of that. Yeah. So how, 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 how has that, is that um, still there, you know what I mean? Yeah, there is, uh, there is a real sense of, uh, yeah. But I'm actually coming to terms with the fact that that is my life and instead of oh, battling right. against right. it now, I'm actually saying, well, this is the way it is. I'm never going to be in any one particular place for a long time. But as long as I can keep my ties with Ireland and, right, and right. keep my ties in America, I'll, I'll be okay. I'm facing up to that and accepting that now, that right. that's the way it's going to be. At the end of our 1988 interview, Gabriel Burns said that when he was young, he used to have nightmares about selling his soul. And he told me that he'd certainly not want to do that for what he described as something as ephemeral as movies. So to end this interview, I asked, could he still say that? And had he, since we last met, sold his soul in the name of cinema? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that's true kind of of most people. I mean, I think that because people work in movies that in some way that it's kind of, that it's different. I don't think I'd be any different really if I, if I, 
if I worked in any other field, really. I mean, my life would be an awful lot easier and I'd be an awful lot richer and an awful lot more famous if I didn't have these fucking stupid ideas. And I swear to God, they, they really do cost me money. Sure. They cost me a lot of money. Um, when Into the West was being made, I was offered Lethal Weapon 3. And they offered All me right. so much money for four weeks' work that I could have just like not worked for three years. But there was never a choice. Right. And I right. hated it. There was a part of me that hated myself for it. I said, why can't I just go and do it? Why can't I just go to Hollywood, sit in a caravan, play cards at Mel Gibson, get a load of money and just coast till Christmas? And, and just like do five or six scenes. What am I doing out on top of a mountain in Wicklow in the snow, doing the thing about travellers? Sure. For no money. And um, I'm but not you're... saying that in a, in a trumpeting way. I'm All saying right. that there's a part of me that kind of says, <laughs> Jesus, would you stop it? Just do it. I know there are friends of mine who say to me, just do it. Would you stop it? Stop analysing it. But it's not. Because I feel that I want to, I want to do the right thing, whether people agree with it or not and I'm always getting people saying to me well why don't you do why didn't you do that and why didn't you yeah. do this and why aren't you there and, uh, you know that's the way it is would you still you said to me last time too not give a fuck if it really ended tomorrow would you feel that more now because you do have a child another child on the way and you have got Ellen or yeah I, I mean I probably would miss um, certain things about it but well the political involvement for one obviously yeah. Political in the way you perceive it. Yeah. See, I don't regard myself really as a politi an active political person. No, but, but, person, but culturally, but... Th there's a political agenda within culture which not everybody's addressed. You and I do. Yeah. You yeah. know this because we've talked on it on that level. Politics yeah. with a small bit. Yes. That way. Yes. And I do regard, you know, what I do as political. In, 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 yeah, I do regard it as political. I do because I think right. that most things that you do in some way or another are kind of. They do, they do have a payoff somewhere down the line. Well, especially popular culture like movies and rock because they have the widest possible audience. This sure. is what we talked about sure. earlier. And it's very difficult to resist that um, kind of pressure to be part of that cultural thing, you know? I, I could very easily have been, like, much, as I said, much more famous in right. an acceptable way th than I am now. And uh, sometimes I feel that people are kind of disappointed that I'm not, you know, in a, in a way that... Uh, so because they're evaluating things, success on money, on the dollars exactly, made, exactly. on big stars, it, 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 stars. Absolutely. You don't and equate your success that way at 42 you, years old. No, not at all. Not at all. And, and, and it's a very, very difficult thing to get across to people without sounding like a fucking windbag, you know. It doesn't matter to you. It matters. Their very. perception of you rather than your perception well, I, of yourself. Well, I would be a liar if I said that it didn't, okay. that it didn't matter to me. It does matter to me, sure. But it doesn't matter to me to the extent that I'll be willing to go along with it. I'll say, right. eh, I can right. see why, but actually this is more important. Did you ever get so depressed before Miller's Crossing and all that that you got into the drink-drug syndrome? I know you, you didn't then. Well, I think that, I think that you know, drink um, is, um, it's a symptom, really. Um of an underlying discontent and, and a kind of basic restless and unhappiness. It's a depressant. And if you take enough of the depressant, you eventually become depressed and you see the world through those, through those eyes. And I found that one of the greatest liberations was actually saying, okay, I don't have to do this anymore, right. you know? And um, I'm really glad that I made that decision to do that, you know? Was it a problem? Um, I think that it could have become right. a major problem. No doubt about that. But all this is part of that process of denial of self, denial of feelings, denial of what a man is. Yeah. I mean, these are things men have to, and women, obviously, have to yeah. come to terms with, and you, you've struggled to do it I, your I, own way. I, I, have, I, I have struggled to really overcome what I regard as the things that everybody has weights around their ankles, handicaps that they have to deal with. And, like, and uh, I'm, I've really tried since, especially since going to the States, very, very hard to try and come to terms with myself. And... I genuinely mean it when I say that I've never been at a happier, more creative, more fulfilled, uh, exciting time in my life, both as a as a as an actor, as a producer, and as as a person. I I went through a lot of you know, kind of like dark kind of things, and and uh, I am just so um, content with. Uh, what I've achieved so far, I don't just mean as an actor, but right. as a person, coming to terms with myself, 
because I had the real potential to annihilate myself. Sure, sure. Okay, that sounds like a very good last night, doesn't it? Good ending. Yeah, well, I know you'll, yeah, I know you'll have a good one. A clearly contented Gabriel Byrne back then. I thank you for listening to this edition of the Joe Jackson Interviews podcast. And don't forget that my ebook, Gabriel Byrne, the Joe Jackson Interviews Plus, is available from Amazon, Apple iBooks, and wherever ebooks are sold. <laughs>